قبله نستعين وهو الأول وهو الآخر وهو الله وهو الباطن لا إله إلا هو لا إله إلا الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته At the end of the last, last talk uh, we began to see how the uh, system of the great master begins to reveal its true insights and its ability to assist us and help us, inshallah, into the understanding and the cognition of the mysteries or the asrar of unveiling of kashf that comes to people who aspire to knowledge and to manifest. Knowledge is both ilm in Arabic as well as ma'rifa. Ilm is the knowledge that comes from the totality of awareness of all verifiable realities. Ma'rifa is knowledge that is both ilm and that has been confirmed or verified by unveiling. So, to try to translate the words into uh, English, ilm is the science. It is the all knowledge that can be subjected to various tests of validity, both sentient and non-sentient. Ma'rifa is the Gnostic science, the science that comes both from ilm, that is from knowledge of verifiable entities that can be tested as well as knowledge that comes only through direct access to the divine names and attributes of Allah SWT. All knowledge belongs to Allah in the system of in Arabi which is nothing more than just an elaboration of true Islam all knowledge belongs to Allah only Allah knows all. The knowledge that we aspire to bring us to the understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can bring us only to the station of proximity. It can never bring us to knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His totality because as you have heard time and again, only Allah knows Allah. In Arabi also confirms that in as much as all knowledge is Allah's, all true and useful activity is the knowledge that leads us back to that source. Knowledge for the sake of accumulation of facts and figures, knowledge for the sake of developing proofs, knowledge for the sake of interpreting and ordering the world around us and the cosmos is only useful in as much as it leads us to the source of all knowledge. There has been in the past attempts to try to define Sufism as the as its essence being either love or knowledge. It's a very crude distinction, as it were, between those who believe and aspire to the proximity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through ishq, through mahabba, through overflowing love, such as the uh, Khurasani school of Tasawwuf that we talked about, culminating in masters such as Ibn Rumi. And those who believe and live a life that is devoted to acquiring knowledge that leads to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This kind of distinction, if it's valid, will put Ibn Arabi in the category of the latter. His tasawwuf, his knowledge of certainty, his ilm al-yaqeen, his eye of certainty, his ayn al-yaqeen, and his haqq al-yaqeen, his reality of certainty, came through his striving for knowledge that leads to Allah SWT. There are really three kinds of knowledge that Ibn Arabi talks about. It is the knowledge that comes from 
aql, from reason. It is a knowledge that comes from the utilization of our rational faculties in order for us to order and understand the signs and signals of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the knowledge of the philosophers. This is the knowledge of the speculative theologians. Another, this is a valid knowledge. Another valid knowledge is a knowledge that comes from Sharia, from knowing the scale and mizan of the law. That knowledge is also true. It is also confirmable. And the third type of knowledge is the knowledge that comes from revelation, from wahi. So the totality of knowledge that is accessible to us is a combination of all three. It's a combination of revelatory knowledge that comes from the sharia, that comes from the words and actions and sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and the rulings that come from the Qur'an al It is a knowledge that comes from us using our rational faculties and it is a knowledge that comes from iha or from revelation. The, all of these forms of knowledge are the means and mechanisms by which the divine name Al-Hakim, the wise, which is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the means by which we are able to reach a station or proximity to him using that knowledge that is useful. There is no limit to Allah's knowledge. There is no limitation or bounds. There is no had to it. Allah's knowledge is infinite. And as Allah is the Hakim, as Allah is the Alim, Allah is the wise, Allah is the knower, it is through these names that we can aspire to reaching the station of nearness and proximity to Him. And the seat by which we can gain these three forms of valid knowledge, the knowledge that comes from revelation, the knowledge that comes from our reason and our rational faculties, and the knowledge that comes from acting according to the precepts of the Sharia, the seat of that knowledge is the heart. And it is the awakening of the heart to these forms of knowledges that makes the heart able to turn to the signs and signals of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, I mentioned that uh, Ibn Arabi talks frequently about ilm being the form of science and ma'rifa, which is a form of Gnostic science. And both these words are used frequently interchangeably. But he does refer to the greatest walis of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the arifun, those who have ma'rifa. He also says that knowledge cannot be gained through ma'rifa if it's divorced from a'mal, from action. This is really is has become as it were, one of the fixtures of true Islam, that knowledge without action, that knowledge without the willingness and desire and ability to put it into reality, to act it, to live it, to absorb it, becomes simply knowledge that is not useful. But the Prophet ﷺ says, لا نافع. علم, may Allah protect us from knowledge that has no use. And knowledge that is divorced from action, divorced from practical, effective, outer-oriented action becomes knowledge that is, to a large extent, superfluous. And he maintains that the name of Zahir, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the outer, the manifest, requires action because it is more inclusive than the name Al-Batil, or the non-manifest. So inasmuch as knowledge is, has a non-manifest component to it, that is, in the forms of ideas, in the form of faith, in the form of belief, in the form of, of the totality of one's orientation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It must have also an outer feature to it, if it is to reflect the true divine name of the manifest. So the non-manifest is encompassed by the name the manifest. And action, a'mal, is a necessary concomitant to true knowledge or true proximity of knowledge to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
uh, I noted earlier that in Arabi says that the usefulness of knowledge why do we seek to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is one of the central themes that runs throughout his books that the actions and the passage of the true seeker is through time and through life is to find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the usefulness of knowledge is only if it leads to a sense of tawheed if it leads to a sense of the unicity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the totality of the divine order subsumed under the name Al-Wahid knowledge that does not lead to Tawheed that does not lead to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is knowledge that is not useful knowledge that leads to Tawheed knowledge that leads to the proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the knowledge <coughs> that we all aspire to inshallah and it is through seeing and through connecting the various realities around us the various signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala around us that make us recognize the unicity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is the purpose of all true seekers all true salafs should order their actions should consider their actions in light of them seeing the interconnectedness of things and thereby understanding the unicity of tawheed and the unicity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Recognition of useful knowledge leads, in Arabic says, to sa'ada or felicity. Living a life of seeking knowledge that is not in tawheed, that does not lead to us recognizing the interconnectedness of things, leads to wretchedness or shaqa. And to him, one of the attributes, one of the features of the garden or of paradise is where to those of us, inshallah, who are in state of true ma'rifah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discloses himself in infinitely varying forms and varieties of beauty and of gentleness, of jamal and of lutf. And one of the features of the hellfire, of a nar, to those who do not see the interconnectedness of things, is the continuous shock of realization of their con- ignorance while they were in time. Fire to him is a form of wretchedness whereby the person who does not see the interconnectedness of things begins to see them in their constant totality. And while the Arif, the one who aspires to proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sees the interconnectedness of things, he witnesses thereby the lot, the gentleness, the subtle. And wretchedness, <coughs> shaqa, fire, is when you see that and you recognize that this is reality, not what you thought was reality. <coughs> reality is not knowing Newton's laws, is not knowing the laws of quantum mechanics, is not knowing economic uh, principles. Reality is knowing that these are all forms of Allah's manifestations and all forms of lot of Allah's The divine names in the great master play a part in this. The divine names of beauty, the divine names of gentleness, the divine names that encourage felicity and move us towards felicity are the commanding names of all those who seek knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is the action of these names which are in number and in weight much greater than the names of wrath the names of severity which is the true gauge and litmus test of the success of the person seeking marf. as we seek knowledge we are commanded to fall under the power of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that point us towards felicity and not to fall under the commanding names <coughs> where the severity and wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is manifest. Knowledge is infinite in the what is known by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah knows all. We have the potential of knowing some at any given point in time. The totality of knowledge is infinite. What is open to us and accessible to us must be finite. But because it is infinite, because it is constantly 
revealing itself because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly discloses himself in every single instant of creation the potential for us to be in a constant state of thrall of constant state of felicity that comes from seeing the interconnectedness of things is the true station of the one who has reached the ma'rifah the true gnosis that leads him to the station of proximity it is this constant unlimited self-disclosure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the infinite knowledge that comes from this state of constant thrall now it is what we aspire to and that is what is given to us inshallah as the just reward for all of this action just reward for all this action is to be in a state of sa'ada to be in a state of felicity in this earth and in the next that is the whole purpose of knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is for us to be in a state of absolute joy and absolute thrall in knowing that we are dwelling in this ocean this ocean of oneness so seeking knowledge in itself is an endless task the uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah Taha Rabbi zidni ilman Oh Allah, increase me in knowledge implying and stating that knowledge itself is a never ending process we can never be satisfied by the knowledge that we have pain in and of itself certainty in and of itself must bring us to the point where we witness all the time every fractional moment of existence we see the creative activity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every day, every instant of time as we talked about last week Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an act of creation and the act of creation itself when seen through the inner eye must bring enormous joy and must bring us enormous wonder and must bring us to a station of constant amazement and constant thrall this, this is why knowledge to us must lead to this sense of absolute tawheed and in the process lead us to the path of true joy and felicity. <clears throat> so Mahabi really does not have much room to say or much much to say about the ascetics, those who withdraw from the world, those or those who claim that you can access Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without passing through the secondary causes of creation the cosmos to the Arabic and I believe to all of us inshallah who are true salics are signs and signals of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they are Allah's ways of showing us how to reach proximity to we cannot ignore all of these signs we cannot ignore the secondary causes we cannot ignore that the cosmos has been created the universe has been created the various spheres of existence have been created in order for us to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so those who, who say that they are in a state of constant uh, wonderment because they are in direct connection to the higher are ignoring and are discourteous to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they do not dwell on the secondary causes in order to find the primary cause. It is the dwelling on the secondary causes that in and of itself that constitutes shirk. It is not dwelling on the secondary causes in order to find the real, the haqq, that is the source of truth. So, all of us, inshallah, who are trying to stay on this path, who are trying to maintain the integrity of our spiritual station and to try to move on, must understand that all around us are signs and signals of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that draw us towards Him. And they are there for that purpose. We cannot circumvent them or go around them or short circuit them by as some pseudo spirituals talk about having direct access there is no such thing as direct access only Allah knows Allah and this is Allah's way of showing us the signpost towards him so zuhud in the sense of withdrawing from the world of denouncing the world a skepticism that is that is uh, 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 in many ways a form of denunciation of the world a skepticism whereby you lose 
any connection and interaction with the world is not only to be denounced, it is also discourteous, in Arabi says, to the way in which we should conduct ourselves with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah has made all of these infinite acts of creation in order for us to know Him. And it is through these acts that we know Him. It is through these manifestations that we know Him. There is no other way by which we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or reach the station of proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of this. So the secondary causes, the cosmos, are signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are not to be renounced, they are not to be denounced, we are not to withdraw from them. We are to interact with them, live with them, mingle with them, and see through them. And it is this process of seeing through them that leads to the true knowledge, inshallah. How do we acquire knowledge? How do we gain access to this knowledge? What is the mechanism by which we can say that we have a system within us that is able to recognize the haq from the batil, truth from untruth, reality from illusion. And the Arabi says that the system within us with, with which knowledge interacts is what he calls al latif al-insaniya. That is the human, subtle reality, which in other words, soul. it is the mechanism by which the various forms of modes of acquiring knowledge interact and impose themselves and becomes, it is the sieve through which all information, be it spiritual, revelatory, transmittery, or through kashf, is poured through it. The modes of recognizing knowledge is the aql, the intellect, and the heart, which is the qalb. Knowledge of reflection that comes through reflection, that is the way in which reason thinks. Reason reflects, therefore it is able to judge. So reflection is the mode by which reason interprets and acquires knowledge. Unveiling or kashf is the mode by which the heart understands and accepts knowledge. These two, with revelation, is the way in which the soul, and nafs al the complete soul, which is part of the divine subtlety in man, in humankind, is allowed to recognize the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the his lot, through his subtlety and grace, allows that element in us which we call the soul, which is the Latif al Rabbani. It is the one that is connected to the highest sphere possible. Allows that entity to reflect, allows that entity to experience unveiling, and allows that entity to accept revelation through faith. Reflection is the mode of reason. Unveiling is the mode of the heart and revelation is the transmission that we receive from Iha, from the unseen and it is the mode of faith, of Iman. Reason in, in Arabi is not something that is that stands in contradiction to the soul. It is part of the soul. It is part of the human totality. It is, in many ways, a spiritual faculty. Reason is not a non-spiritual faculty. In modern times, we juxtapose reason against spirit. We juxtapose aql against uh, intuition. This is really nonsense. This juxtaposition is purely modern construct. It is a construct of an age which does not see the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala behind, during, and after every single event. Reason in both in, in Arabi as well as in classical Islam generally, as well as in the system of thought of all the great thinkers, all the great masters of past ages and modern ages, is a faculty that is necessarily part of the human soul. Reason perceives what he calls a drak. What reason perceives, it perceives through the five senses. The five senses send back signals to reason. And their signals are incontrovertible. When I see something, that 
sight of it gives me incontrovertible evidence. When I see this 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 sign, when I see the Asma'ala al-Husna on there, when I see this wall, it is an incontrovertible evidence as far as reason is concerned. This is the drak. It is what is known in Arabic as darul. It is a necessary and incontrovertible fact. We have the five senses and there is the sixth sense which is the sense of reflection. And these six senses, the five senses of touch, sight, etc., and the sense of consideration, of reflective consideration, is what the faculty of reason is about. And what gives reason its spiritual dimension is the quality of reflective consideration. Another al-fikri, as he calls it. Now, why does reason sometimes lead us astray? It is because of the poor condition of the reflective quality in us. It is as a result of this nadar al-fikr, this reflective consideration that we have is poor. The poverty of that reflective consideration by not being able to see behind, through and into things, into their meanings, into their ma'na is what differentiates spiritual man from materialist man. And these are these are my my attributions, but in modern terms this is what in Arabic means in terms of the reflective consideration of reason. It is not that reason in and of itself does not understand the realm of the spirit. Reason does. It's given that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us that faculty within reason to be able to understand the divine realities. But it is the poverty of our reflective consideration that allows us to uh, go into an element of darkness by which we do not use this faculty in order to see through things and therefore that faculty does not become the torch that lights inner sight. The way in which this reflective faculty of reason is dominated and is defeated is by two factors. One he calls them shahwa or passion and the other one he calls hawa or whims. These are the two things that if out of balance with the reflective faculty dominate reason. Passion and whim or caprice are two elements that are necessary for the survival of man, even a spiritual man. But they have to come under the dominance of the reflective faculty. When we reflect on things in order to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala behind them and in them, we must not allow our whims to dictate what we see. What we see must be resonating truly with our own being, subject to certain permanent, incontrovertible criteria, mainly the law and the sharh and revelation. When we start seeing things and explaining things according to our own terms, according to our own quote-unquote reason, is where caprice, where whim, takes over from the reflective faculty. At the same time, and similarly, when we allow the uh, the fact that when we are trying to see the dominance of passion over us is sometimes necessary for the continuity of things. Passion is necessary in order to undertake certain actions. It is absolutely essential for the continuation of the race. It is absolutely essential if we are in a state of anger, if we are in a state of rightful anger. But to allow passion to dominate the reflective faculty puts passion on the same level as caprice, the same level as whim. And when that dominates, then the reflective faculty that allows reason to see and know the way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes dominated by the modernist dilemma that we see all around us, whereby the passion of things, the sensuality of things is allowed to dominate, and the constant interpretation according to one's own scale, one's own personal scale, be it the scale of an individual, be it the scale of an ideology, be it the scale of the so-called law of man, all these scales invert the whole system and make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rather than the center 
of this entire web of interconnectedness, he becomes outside and frequently not within any system by which we try to understand how things are around us. So when reason is greater than passion, when reason dominates passion, when reason dominates caprice, then everything is in its proper place and the reflective faculty can then begin to reach its apogee of seeing with inner sight. When the opposite takes place, when caprice and passion and whims dominate, the result is what we see around us. And it is really the source of wretchedness, the source of anxiety, the source of instability, the source of turbulence in man. When the reflective faculty of reason is not allowed its true uh, measure. Reason tells us that Allah is incomparable. That is the tanzi we talked about last time. The transcendence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be understood by reason. The tashbih, the similarity through the divine names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be understood by reason. The other faculties must come into play. So that faculty of reason through the reflective consideration and novel al-fikri can lead us, if properly oriented, towards understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the incomparable, as the transcendent, as the absolutely uh, mighty, as the powerful, as the one, as the everlasting. The aspects of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the attributes of the divine names that relate to us cannot be understood by reason. Reason cannot understand the word al kareem the generous, or the repentant, the one to whom we seek repentance or the uh, wahab, the bestower, bestower of mercies. Mercy itself is, is a divine name that cannot be reached by reason. Reason can understand or can try to understand the everlasting, can try to understand the names of divinity, of Elohim, but it will not be able to understand the names relating to tashbih or similarity through which, inshallah, we'll be able to rise up the scale. And this is where the knowledge that comes through unveiling is another element of the human soul, of the, of the universal soul within man that allows us to gain access to this knowledge. So, what is what the comparability of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ma siwa Allah, what is not Allah, can be understood by reason. How to reverberate with the divine names of similarity to us is the realm of the heart. It's the realm of the spirit within us that meditates on the similarities of the divine names to the human condition. Combine these two together. Combine the reflective consideration in reason with unveiling that comes from a healthy heart. And faith, inshallah we'll come to that at later stage, faith in the wahi and the iha and in revelation. And we have the equipment, the spiritual equipment necessary to embark on this journey. If any of these is out of balance, it is our duty. It is our duty to put these balances correct. It is our duty to see where these balances are to be reoriented in order for us to be in a true state of longing, yearning for the station of proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if our reflective consideration is out of balance, whereby our whims which include, which may include the belief in the primacy of certain theories about mankind or certain theories relating to science or certain theories relating to social science or biology, if all of these are dominating us, if modern education, if contemporary life has embedded in us the belief, even though it is subtly within us, that there is truth in these things, in and of themselves, then it is our duty not to chuck them out, but it is our duty to see where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fits into this knowledge that we have. What is the use of knowing how the laws of physics operate, or the laws of economics, or the principles of economics operate, or how humans interact with each other, if we do not see the purpose behind all of that, 
is to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, He did not create humanity or the jinn except to worship Him and by worshipping Him. All the great interpreters of the Quran, all the great mufassirun say it means knowing Him. So knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a necessary condition for all of our actions and for all of our uh, attributions. That, that he talks about and may contradict some of the uh, acquired uh, conditions that we believe may lead us to knowledge. It's the issue, whole issue of taqlid or imitation. Taqlid in, or imitation in, in Arabic is not imitation of a person in authority. It has nothing to do with imitating or following in the line of a person whom we recognize as being a master in a specific uh, area of outer knowledge or even inner uh, state. The only true taqlid, the only true imitation is that of the Prophet Sallallahu because he is the guide and the signpost to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He is the highest authority that he says we should follow and must follow. Therefore, the whole corpus of the Prophet's actions, words, sayings, states is his guidepost. And it is the guidepost of the Prophet ﷺ, which leads, he says, inevitably to knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the true way in which taqlid should be done. And this taqlid or this imitation should be further confirmed by what he calls tahqiq, which is verification through unveiling. So, following in the path of Prophet ﷺ, following in the path of those who have followed absolutely in the path of Prophet ﷺ, as well as verifying all of that by inner witnessing leads us to true imitation of the prophetic way and leads us to earning what he calls makaram al-akhlaq that is the combination of all the great qualities that we and characteristics that we all inshallah aspire to he talks also about unveiling and the various ranks of unveiling that comes High, the highest being the knowledge of the mysteries or hulul asrar which comes only through the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the casting of the, the breath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heart that is prepared, and that is in a state to accept it. The law, the sharia, which knowledge of the sharia to Ibn Arabi is not only important, it is vital to aspiring to any form of knowledge. Knowledge as the law the law as the mizan, the law, the sharia as the scale by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala judges things and by which we are able to judge the justice and injustice of things. This adil that comes from knowing the scale. In Arabic says everything in creation has a scale attached to it. And by scale he means a mechanism by which we are able to, to trigger it. For example, he says reason the scale of reason is logic, or what he calls mantak. The scale of human speech is nahu, or is grammar, and so on. Every single principle of existence is subject to a scale. And the scale of justice, that is the way in which we are to act and live in order to earn Allah's rahmah in our life and in our ability to live according to the precepts of what is felicitatious, what is going to lead us to true joy and happiness is the scale of the shara of the law. It is not possible to reach knowledge or to reach a station of proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without using the sharia, without using the law as part of our spiritual uh, load, as part of the necessary Information is part of the necessary mix that we have to carry with us in order to aspire to this knowledge. And this knowledge certainly is a necessary feature of all of those who seek the passage to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sharia is a question of knowing the ahkam, that is the rulings and the orders that come as a result, as a result of divine injunctions through the Quran. And it is knowing the akhbar or the ahadith of the Prophet and all of his actions and his sunnah. This is the totality of what he means by the scale of the law. 
Mizan Shah. And he compares the Sharia in the way in which the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when the word kun be was spoken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the kalima, how that kalima as it le- left the first divine presence and moved to the arsh or the footstool or the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, divided into five categories, which are the five categories that we know of as being the elements of the Sharia. What is obligatory, what is recommended, etc. These are the he gives the Sharia itself, the law itself, a certain uh, significance in the structure of his cosmic order, because it is the word of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala which has bifurcated and then bifurcated subsequently into the various elements that are the anchor stones and cornerstones of the Sharia. It is through the mizan, through the scale, that justice or adil is established, and. Adil, or justice, is to put everything in its proper place. He links Adil, or justice, to wisdom, which he says is, as injustice is to put everything in its proper place, wisdom is to put everything in its proper place and to act in a proper way as it relates to a proper condition. So this ordering, this tertiary, of how one should Establish justice and wisdom is a question of knowing what the law, the scale tells us as to how to put things, give true things their true measure, their true taqdeer, and give things their true ordering in this way in which we are to respond to the myriad of stimuli that we achieve that, are, that impinge on us on a daily basis. The ability to order, the ability to put things in ranks, the ability to sequence things, and to subject them to a scale which leads to sa'ada, which leads to felicity, is the purpose. The purpose obviously is social, is to order and organize the uh, society as a whole. But society as a whole cannot aspire to a spiritual status. It is only the sum total of the state and the ahwal and the maqams of each and every one of its constituent parts. So the shar or the, the law, which we think of frequently nowadays as the means by which Muslims organize themselves, as the means by which Muslims try to live according to the injunctions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we give it a social dimension and contrast it to the haqiqa. There's a haqiqa and there's a sharia. Or not contrast it, but, but put it on a different uh, platform. Than the Sharia. In reality, in the system of the Great Master, the Sharia itself has a haqiqi element to it. And the haqiqi element to it is this inner scale that we have to have. And that inner scale is the word of Allah SWT that comes from the Quran and the makaram al akhlaq the quality of characters, noble characters, that are those of the Prophet وسلم, which comes from modeling ourselves after his actions. He says that the knowledge that comes from the reflective faculty unveiling, balanced by the scale, and then added to it iman and faith is the signs of the true wayfarer, of the true sadiq. And it is the refinement of all of these that allows us, inshallah, not only to call ourselves, but to live the life of the true wafer, of the true sadiq. It is because the system of knowledge of the great master has as its third leg. One is the, the completion of the latif al insaniya the human soul. The second one is the ability of our part, on the part of a person, in true, in true wayfaring, in being a true salik, to add to this iman or faith. The word iman comes from the root alif mi nun, to feel secure, to be safe. 
And Iman is to feel certainty and to feel security that the all knowledge is the knowledge that belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is what we recognize as being attributable to us is merely a reflection of the reality that all knowledge belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is this, the security in that, the firmness that we have in that, the firmness that we have in this belief is what Iman is about, what faith is about. And faith is to confirm and to verify by the tongue as well as by the heart these facts, these spiritual facts that all knowledge is Allah's knowledge. And what we have are merely signals and signs in order to reach the station of proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Faith is both through unveiling and through confirmation and attestation. It is Iman or the faith of the person is can be self evident or it can be confirmed to us by reason. But reason by itself, the attestation of certain positions and statements are insufficient for faith to be established. For faith to be established in a person, there has to be an element of certainty or tayaqqun. And this tayaqqun cannot come from simply the acceptance of the principles that govern our knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come from just the considerative reflective faculty. And when I say reason, I don't necessarily mean the use of logic. I'm talking about the use of logic that tries to see behind everything the acts and the force of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Reason or faith that comes as a result of proof is insufficient. It's insufficient for us to give us the necessary sense of security. If I can prove, as it were, the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by using rational calculations, by using speculative thinking, it does not necessarily lead to you having faith. It does not lead to that sense of absolute security or certainty that comes from having that attested and affirmed in you. It can help. It can come before it. It can come during it. It can come after it. But it does not come because of it. So all of these attempts to prove this or to prove that, in and of themselves, are really useless actions because they do not lead to the desired goal. The desired goal is to create a station whereby you have that sense of security in what you know. That the knowledge of what you know is precise, it is firm, it is unshakable. And that knowledge cannot come by somebody proving it to you. It can come perhaps by you accepting it from your your environment, it can come from you accepting it as a result of your a birthright, but it cannot come through rational considerations. It cannot come through rational proof. Rational proofs can assist, can direct, can push you in certain directions. But ultimately, the confirmation of that has to come from the other faculty. And that other faculty, as we all know, is the faculty of kashf that comes from the, the heart. That's where the locus of it is. Faith that is that comes automatically as a result of your birth, as a result of your, of your, uh, the way that you have, you have lived, and it is based upon you having that sense of security, is not really his consideration. He is, he says these people are people of who are already in a state of absolute joy, because their faith is unshakable. It's not shaken by either proofs to the contrary or by evidence to the contrary or whatever. He is r- discussing really the conditions and the realities of people who are on the path, people who want to have their iman, their faith, attested and confirmed. In faith, he also tries to uh, link the way in which we interpret, the way which we uh, try to order and to understand what comes from reading Revelation or what comes from reading the uh, Quran Kareem. 
if iman calls for an unquestioning acceptance of the divine reports and of the orders and of the injunctions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if it comes also from recognition and acceptance that the hadith and the way of the Prophet sallallahu is the way to true sa'adat, true joy and felicity then what are the mechanisms by which this the way that we imbibe the way that we read the way that we accept this information what kind of mechanism is that to be tested and he uses the word ta'weel the way in which the uh, Quran Kareem is to be read and the way in which we understand this, this spiritual significance and monument of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the monumental spiritual station of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam comes from this ta'weel and ta'weel is not interpretation as such but it is to bring things back to their root to bring things back to their first principles it is different from what we call ta'wil nowadays. What we call ta'wil, and in particular the Shia, have been uh, said to use ta'wil as a way of interpreting the Quran. That is going into the hidden meaning or apparent hidden meaning or attributions in the Quran. Trying to see the inner and outer aspects of it, the manifest and the non manifest of it. In Arabic, it doesn't mean that. In fact, in Arabic, it does not accept this kind of interpretation of the Quran. What ta'wil to in Arabic means is to bring everything back to the ultimate test of whether it helps, assists us in reaching knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we read a Quranic verse, we must read in it and through it what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to tell us. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us and we are trying to understand. And is to understand that going to the root principle which is that Allah is behind all actions, Allah is behind all utterings, that allows us to see with inner sight the true meaning of it. It is not that, that a statement or an ayah in the Quran has an inner and outer aspects to it. It is not that at all. This is the Batani interpretation or some of the uh, certain Sufic interpretation of the Quran or certain Sufic tafasir of the Quran in, in earlier times talked about its outer and inner aspects its manifest and non-manifest some of the Shia uh, tafasir or interpretation of the Quran see it this way this is not what Ibn Arabi sees Ibn Arabi says that when we read the Quran we must read it with the eyes that it is the kalam Allah it is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has an outer and inner that is true absolutely real but it can only have any meaning to us if it reverberates in the right locus. And the right locus must be the locus whereby we are able to see the light of Allah SWT in these words. And whatever those words have in terms of their significance back to us is what that Quranic ayah means. It is not what somebody said it means. It is not what Sheikh such and such said at such and such a date. Or it is not what the great tafsir of this master or that master. All these great tafasirs are, are fine. But we must not accept them if we are on the path, inshallah. It is only as signals and guides for those of us. When we read the Quran, we try to read it with the eyes of inner sight. And whatever that has, if our inner sight is true and is genuine, and it is not overwhelmed by winds and caprice and illusions and, and wham and all of these things, then whatever it reverberates to us is its true meaning. And that true meaning comes from ta'wil. Ta'wil comes from the Arabic word awal, which means the first, going back to the first, going back to the first principle. So faith that comes from us reading the Quran comes as a result of us being able to undergo ta'wil, to undergo the process of seeing the reality of the words through this mechanism within us that can reverberate with this reality. And if we do that, we are able to earn the to earn our faith. Even though we might have it, we'll be able, we'll be able to say that our faith is a result of Allah's bestowal, wahab, of faith on us. Our faith is not something that comes as a result of our actions. It is also an action of a divine name. And the divine name is a wahab that guides those 
inshallah, who have faith or a sense of absolute security. And the wahab, the bestower, is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through His grace and love, bestows upon us faith, He allows us to see the reality of the words and the principles of the words as it relates to us. The point of it is us. It's us as individuals. And us acting, behaving, thinking, doing correctly is what constitutes the social balance. That's what constitutes a society in balance and a society that is heading towards felicity. Inshallah. At this point, activity is say, may Allah give us always the light that will lead us to strengthening our faith, to allowing us to be secure in our iman. Subhanahu wa bika bi izzati amma sifun wa salamu wa mursaleen. Alhamdulillah. Seventy-six. Allah confirms that He is the knower of all. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah Allah bi kulli shayin alim. Allah is the knower of all. In Surah Al-An'am, that Surah six, Ayah fifty-nine. Wa hindu mafatih al-Ghayb. He has the keys to all the unseen and all that is not known to man. Surah Al-Ra'd, that Surah thirteen, Ayah two. Yufassil ayat li'allakum liqai rabbukum tuqinun. He separates and orders the, his signs in order that you are to know that you are certain in meeting your Lord. Uh, Surah Taha, that's Surah 20, Ayah 114. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa qul rabbi zidni ilman. O Allah, O my Lord, increase me in knowledge. That's in Surah Taha. Uh, Surah Al-Anbiya, Surah 21, Ayah 47. And we place the scales, the scales of justice on the Lord. Uh, Surah uh, Surah 39, Ayah 9. Do those who know, can those who know be compared to those who do not know? Can they be put on the same level? Surah Al-Dariyat, Surah 51, Ayah 50. Kafiru Allah and flee to Allah. We, we seek refuge in Allah. We seek refuge in Allah from all jahil, from all ignorance. And in Surah, in the same uh, Surah, Surah 51, Ayah 56, Allah says, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, wa rahman rahim wa ma khalaqtu al jinni wal ins illa li ahdun. And I did not create humanity and the jinn except to worship me. Or to know me. So the the sagacity of the great master is a combination of all that we talked about. It's a combination of rational consideration, a combination of unveiling, and a combination of absolute and unshakable iman.